Well, good day to you all and welcome to you all. Today, in a way, we start with our journey of faith. And beginning today, we will be taking you step by step on how we increase our faith. For the Lord himself said, to the one who has faith, everything is possible. But faith, unfortunately, is not something you can get by just going to the marketplace and buying it. You can't get faith by taking some capsules from the pharmacy. Faith is got only by hearing the word of Christ, so says the Bible. Which means that you cannot separate faith from the Bible. We cannot build up faith unless we go into the Bible. Now a whole lot of people are reading the Bible, but somehow they say that faith is not growing in them. Very often people read the Bible and they find it to be a boring book. They feel that it goes above their head or it's the easiest way to put them to sleep. This is because when we approach the Bible and read it, we don't do so with a spirit of humility. The humble person believes that I may know a lot of things. I may be even be highly educated. But when I read the word of God, unless God opens my mind, I cannot understand it. Are you surprised that in Luke 24, it is recorded like this. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Open the minds of the apostles. Imagine three years they were with the Lord, but yet he had to open their minds. The word used here is almost the word that is used when we are opening a can. So our mind needs to be opened by the Lord. This is not our work, this is divine work. And it happens only when you come to the Bible, you begin reading the Bible with the attitude, Lord, I know nothing. If I learn something, it is only if you open my mind. St. Paul, when he went to Macedonia, we are told, in Acts in chapter 16, they preached a large number of people. However, please note, the mind of only one lady was open at Thyatira. Her name was Lydia. She was a dealer in purple cloth. And the Lord opened her mind, says the scripture, to understand what Paul was saying. Therefore, in approaching the Bible, always approach the Bible with a sense of humility. You may know a lot of things. St. Paul at the beginning believed he knew a lot of things. After all, rightly so, he was tutored under the best teachers of the time. Gamaliel, his teacher, was supposed to be the best. In Acts 22, he boasts that I was educated under Gamaliel. Yet, St. Paul could not find Jesus with all that education. It was only one who was thrown down by the Lord and he asked others to lead him because he turned blind and he had to ask others, please, please take me by the hand and lead me into Damascus. Now that's an attitude of humility when he asked others to help you to understand it. In Acts chapter 8 we have the story of the Ethiopian. Well, he was eager to know what was in the scriptures, hence he had bought the book. But whatever he read, he could not understand it. And when Philip came to him, the Ethiopian asked him, Can you explain to me what is written here? Because I cannot understand it unless someone explains it to me. Therefore, this is the attitude with which come today to the Bible. Lord, I cannot with all my intelligence and all my wisdom and all my education understand the sacred book unless you open my mind. And therefore, Always start reading the Bible with a prayer to the Holy Spirit to open our minds that we may understand it. And as you read the Bible, slowly, the Lord will take you to places in the Bible and he'll open your mind to show you how many of the things and the blunders that you and your family and even before you, your ancestors committed were because they did not follow the Bible. There's a story in the Bible of young King Josiah. King Josiah's workers reported that they have found a book in the ruins. 
and the book was dusted and brought out. And 2 Kings chapter 22 records, When King Josiah heard the book being read, he tore his clothes in dismay and he gave the following order. He said, Go and consult the Lord for me and for all the people of Judah about the teachings of this book. The Lord is angry with us because our ancestors have not done what this book says must be done. Wow, what a sentence. And Jesus said in Matthew 23, he says, Now you are doing exactly what your ancestors did in the past. And often our Christian life is one which is bereft of the Bible. We don't know what the Lord is trying to say to us in the Bible. We are living our life as we want. And we think it is a life pleasing to God. Therefore you find in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 3, I know whatever you all did to Jesus Christ was out of ignorance, but repent. So it is no excuse that we don't know. But when we don't know what is in the Bible, it is we and our families who really are the ones who suffer the damage. This is what the Lord said. He says, my people suffer because they don't know what is written in my word. And it is true, isn't it? We may know a lot of things, but we don't know what is written in the Bible. For if we knew what was written in the Bible, we would have applied it in our life. And if we had applied it in our life, we would have found so much of courage and so much of things coming in the form of blessings as well as success. Joshua, for instance, in the Bible, was all trembling all over when Moses died. Moses was a great leader. He died. There was no other leader. Joshua had to take over. And please note what the Lord said to Joshua the moment he took over. Three times the Lord said to him, Take courage, Joshua. Take courage, Joshua. And again, take courage, Joshua. And he went on to explain how to take courage. He said, Meditate on my word day and night. Study it. Therefore, there we have it. Again, whenever we are talking of faith, we are talking of acting in courage and faith, it is inseparable from the word of God. You need to meditate. Read it day and night. Be sure that the book of the law is always read in your worship, the Lord said. Study it day and night. Make sure you obey everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. And as if that was not enough, he repeated it again. He said that, I say to you, just be determined, be confident, make sure that you obey the whole law that my servant Moses gave you. Adding, do not neglect any part of it. And I promise you will succeed wherever you go. So if all this is the background, why do people not give importance to the Bible? Why? For three reasons. Number one, because people think the Bible is a book of nonsense. We live in the 21st century, they feel this is outdated, why should we go by the Bible? Number two, they think it's not going to solve their problems. They feel that problem solving requires something which is not as outdated as the Bible. And third, people do not come to hear the word of God simply because they are too busy. They are busy with their work, with their home responsibilities, with their personal lives. However, the Bible has something to say to those who think that it is nonsense. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, God purposely chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise. He chose what the world considers weak in order to shame the powerful. I remember one occasion when this scripture really came to life was when a father brought his son who was suffering from brain tumor to us and he asked us to pray and we placed our hands on the little boy and we prayed thanking God praising God for this sickness and the father who could not understand why we were thanking and praising God interrupted us at one stage and said why are you all saying, thank you, Lord, praise you, Lord? My son is suffering from a tumor. It could take his life. 
this doesn't seem to be anything to thank God for, for that. And we explain to him that we are doing that only because the Bible says praise and thank God in all situations, whatever, in good situations and bad situations. Well, it did not make sense to the father then. But it did make sense to him when three or four months later, he re-ran the tests at the hospital for the boy and found that the brain tumor was diminishing and it ultimately later, a few months later, disappeared. It made sense then. God's power comes forth only when we not only hear the word of God, but we put it into practice. That is why Jesus said, he said, you're wrong. And do you know why? You don't know the word of God and you don't know the power of God. Two things. We don't know the word of God. We don't know the power of God. First comes the word of God. When we don't know the word of God, we cannot know the next, the power of God. So God chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is so important. How many marks would anyone give the Bible out of 100? In the world today, probably zero upon 100. But the Lord has created a situation where this very thing which you do not give any importance to, this very seed which is the smallest of all seeds, I challenge you, the Lord says, take it into your life, plant it. The smallest seed will become the biggest tree and others will come and nestle in it. But we need this kind of humility, therefore, when we approach the Bible. There has to be that hunger, there has to be that thirst to know, to be eager to know what the Lord is going to teach you every day. Isaiah chapter 50 says, every morning I'm eager to know what the Lord is going to teach me. So that eagerness, that hunger for the word of God should be in us. When St. Paul went to a place called Beria, people listened to his preaching, but they went back to the scriptures and they checked it just to see if what Paul was saying was right or not. So therefore, even if you're going back to the Bible to check whether what the preacher has said is right. It's good. It's a first step. It's a sign that you're taking interest, but it's not sufficient. We have to go deeper than that. We have to have a hunger for the Word of God. And one thing that does not allow us to have this hunger is this thought in our mind that it is not important. It's not so important. It's not practical. On the contrary, this is what Jesus had to say. He said, the stone which the builders rejected as worthless has turned out to be the most important stone of all. And the Lord wanted, went on to describe what would happen. He said, either you don't believe in the word of God, and as a result you cut yourself, you hurt yourself, or if you believe in the word of God and allow it to fall on you, then your life will be transformed. In the words of Jesus, he said, everyone who falls on that stone will be cut to pieces. And the second option, if that stone falls on someone, that person will be crushed to dust. Now we want a situation where we are crushed to dust. We want a situation where the words of the Bible strike a chord in our heart so much that we realize our beginning is dust and our end is dust. We are nothing before God. We can do nothing without God. No wonder St. Peter said it this way. He said, this stone is of great value for you who believe. But for you who do not believe. He repeated the words of Jesus. The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important stone of all. And St. Peter went on to say, this is the stone that will make people stumble. This is the stone that will make people stumble. The rock which will make them fall. And why? They stumbled because they did not believe in the word and in what was God's will for them. So you see, it is impossible to say that I can have faith if you're not meditating on the word of God, if you're not taking in 
regular intake of the word, if you are not studying a day and night in a spirit of humility, not for the sake of just knowledge. There are so many places where people learn the Bibles and their colleges churning out people who learn the Bible. But it does not necessarily mean this is going to lead to saints being produced. Saints are produced when we go into the Bible with a sense of humility. Lord, teach me. Open my mind. Show me. Till today I thought it was nonsense. Till today I thought it was not so important. But now you have opened my eyes and you have shown me. The very thing that the world considers is nonsense, not so important, is the most important thing. The stone which the builders rejected turned out to be the cornerstone. And yes, Lord, I realize that myself, my family, has been cut often in the past by this very stone because we do not believe in it. But Lord, we want this stone now to crush us to dust so that we become the instruments you wanted us to be in your hands. Or summing up as King Josiah said it so well, he said, it is because of this, because our ancestors were not doing what is written in this book, that it has displeased the Lord. Now another reason why people are busy, so busy that they cannot have time to hear the word of God, is a direct, I believe, influence of the devil. The devil somehow makes us so busy, busy with our work, busy with our occupation, busy with other things, that he does not allow us to take this necessary and essential oxygen of the word of God every day. So people end up taking the word of God periodically, maybe at a prayer meeting, maybe at a mass occasionally, or maybe at an occasional retreat. But as you know, you cannot survive with periodic oxygen. You need oxygen every moment. And therefore you will see that it is those who are plunged into receiving the word of God every day, meditating on it, studying it, in a spirit of humility, they grow. We have an interesting incident in the Bible. Moses is before the king of Egypt. You must remember, the king of Egypt had trapped all the Israelites. The king of Egypt was therefore a symbol of the devil. He is the one who traps the children of God. Now the king of Egypt who had trapped the Israelites, Moses goes to him, much like Jesus Christ did. And Moses said to him, O king, I have come to take the people to listen to the word of God. I want to point out to you what the king of Egypt that symbol of the devil said. The king of Egypt, Exodus chapter 5 and verse number 9 says, ordered his slave drivers, make these men work harder and keep them busy. Mind you, not my words. Make them work harder and keep them busy so that they will not listen to this pack of lies. Analyze therefore, the tactics of the devil are twofold. Number one, Keep them busy. Number two, make them feel that the Bible is a pack of lies. So when you keep people busy, they have no time to listen to the word of God. When you keep convincing them that it is a pack of lies, it is nonsense, they may listen, but they never put it into practice in their life. So therefore, the devil, through this twofold tactic, prevents people from hearing, and from obeying. Remember, the word of God which we take in from the Bible is of no use just listening to it. We must put into practice. Look at what James chapter 1 and verse number 22 says. Do not fool yourself or do not deceive yourself by just listening to the word but put it into practice. Number one, listen to the word of God. Number two, put it into practice. These two go together. Listen to the word of God and put it into practice. If you see what Jesus said, Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 8, he said, my mother and my brothers are those who listen to the word of God and obey. So therefore these two steps, listening to the word of God, putting them into practice. James in his letter clarifies, he says, if you look closely into the perfect law that sets people free, if you keep on paying attention to it, 
Do not simply listen, that is take only step one. Do not simply listen and then forget it. But if you put it into practice, you will be blessed by God in what you do. Who will be blessed? Answer, the one who does not simply listen and forgets, but listens and then puts it into practice. These two are so important. So therefore, remember, whenever we do not know the word of God, how are we? We are at a disadvantage. We do not know what God wants us to do. Much less do we know what we have to do. That's why you will understand the context in which St. Peter said, Now my friends, I know what you and your leaders did to Jesus was due to your ignorance. Repent then and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. So ignorance is no excuse to say that I did not know about it. That's why, dear friends, what has happened till today? Let us close it. It's a closed chapter. The Lord says, from now onwards, I want you to turn away from all evil. I want you to listen to my word. And I want you to live according to my word. I want you not only to listen, but I want you to put into practice, obey the, my word. So therefore, dear friends, the whole question is, Acts chapter 17 says like this, God has overlooked the times when people do not know him. But now he commands all of them everywhere, turn away from your evil ways. Can we hear somewhere God speaking to us? It's one thing to do a hectic Bible study. Can we perceive what he's trying to say to us? He says that enough is enough. Now you return to the Bible and you start obeying me and faith will arise. Or as the book of Job says, have you asked God to show you your faults? Have you agreed to stop doing evil? Hearing the word of God enables me to see my faults. Agreeing to stop doing evil means putting the word of God in practice. Therefore, having said this much, we come to the whole question, why do people listen to the word of God but not put it into practice? So therefore, in conclusion we can say that we need to be eager to hear the word of God. Or in the words of Saint Peter, who says it so well, he says, be like a newborn baby, always thirsty for the pure spiritual milk. And why? So that by drinking it, you may grow up and be saved. Growing up in salvation depends so much on your eagerness for that spiritual milk, which is the word of God. In Hebrews, you find it written like this. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. So whenever you have the chance to satisfy your hunger with the word of God, go and fill it. Satisfy it. Hear and listen and listen and listen. Because just as a baby cannot understand what milk is doing to its body, the baby just opens its mouth and drinks the milk and drinks the milk. In the same way, we often cannot understand what the Word of God, how it strengthens us. Just as milk nourishes the baby in ways it does not understand, in the same way God's Word nourishes us in ways we often do not understand. You don't give milk to a baby, the baby will not know, but the results will be seen in the undernourished baby, which is not so strong, perhaps defective. In the same way, when we are not taking in regular intake of the Word of God, not meditating on it, not eager for it, it is a field day for the devil. He waits and he longs for people who are empty. And by the word empty, I mean empty of the Word of God. Jesus himself said, he said, 
and he described the working of the evil spirit. He says, when the evil spirit leaves a person, what does the evil spirit do? It searches for a place of rest. And where does it search for a place of rest? In dry country. Which tells you and me a lot about the evil spirit. The evil spirit is searching for rest, but finds rest only in dry country. In place, in people who are not producing anything for God. No fruit for God. And then Jesus said, when it goes out, it comes back. It thinks, I'll come back to my house. And when it comes back to the house, comes back to the person is left. No doubt, he finds the person clean, maybe because the person has gone for a good confession or a retreat, tidy, all fixed up. But the evil spirit notices one thing, the person with all these tidiness and cleanliness is still empty, empty of the word of God. Now watch what the evil spirit does. It goes out, it brings along seven other spirits even worse than itself. They come and they live there. So when it is all over, that person is in a worse shape than at the beginning. This perhaps explains to us why some people deteriorate. Sometime after a retreat, or after having changed their lives, they go back. And the reason why we have allowed this facility for the evil spirit to come back is simply because we are empty of the word of God. We are no longer eager for it. We are not filled with the richness of the word of God. Therefore, the Bible comes to advise us, see that the richness of the word of God dwells in your hearts. Don't take a little. Don't take little bit amounts. But take in the full amount of the word of God every day. If you want to keep the evil spirit away. If you want to keep flies away from utensils in your kitchen, what do you do? Simply heat up the utensils and the flies will not sit on a hot utensil. If you want to keep the devil away from your life, see that your life is filled with the word of God. Tragically and comically, people in places where the Bible is abundant and reading material is abundant, those people are most biblically illiterate. What a paradox. In places where biblical literature is plenty and abundant, and when there are numerous ways of knowing the Bible, there you find people least interested and biblically illiterate. So let us, as a first step, come back to the Lord today in a spirit of humility. I want to know what the Lord has to say to me through his word, through the Bible. Lord, give me this hunger, this thirst for your word. I just want to know what you would have me to do in my life. And that is the beginning of faith. Faith comes from hearing the word of Christ.